Chara. Okay. Huh. Ephesians chapter one. This is not going to be hard, but it's going to be instructional, hopefully. If you don't have the verses marked, you might ought to mark them and read them. I'm going to talk about trusting in the Lord in the gospel, trusting our gospel of our salvation. But I want to talk about what happens and what should happen in that after you trust the gospel. I went to church with my mother, was forced to go when I was young, got baptized when I was about 13 years old, and it never it really didn't change my life at all. Um, but I was a member of the Gasful Baptist Church for whatever. And uh, when I turned 16, I didn't go back. I didn't want to hear it. I, training union, one of the most awful things that I ever sat through in my life. Some woman to come in there with a brochure and read it. That was supposed to be our worship of God. I just, I didn't care for it. So I never went back, but uh, I never heard the things that we're going to talk about today. I didn't know they were in the Bible. They've always been there. And if you talk to people, you will understand what I'm saying because you've talked to people and they don't have any idea what you're talking about. And it's there in the Bible. So, you know, they're not reading, but in Ephesians chapter one, <clears throat> Paul said, in verse 12, that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted. And of course, he's referring to the Ephesians, and he's really referring to the Ephesians that he didn't know. He went to Ephesus in Acts 19, and he met them. He knew the elders at Ephesians, whatever, at Ephesus, but he didn't know these people because they came along later uh, in belief. And he refers to the pronoun changes in verse 12 that we, that'd be Paul and the ones that first trusted Christ. Then in verse 13, in whom you also, and the other people in verse 15, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith, he had not met them. He was in prison now. When he wrote the Ephesian letter, he was in prison. He didn't get to meet these people, but he heard of their faith uh, in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. And these people that he's writing to here, uh, the saints and faithful. The saints are the ones that first gave to the church at Jerusalem. And if you read the Thessalonian letter, hold your finger here, go to 1 Thessalonians. And, and if you read these things, you begin to understand what he's talking about. In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 4, verse 9, but it's touching brotherly love. You need not that I write unto you, for you yourself are taught of God to love one another. And indeed you do you, I apologize, and indeed you do it toward all brethren which are in Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. And these people that first trusted Christ, that's where Paul was doing his ministry, his his journeys, and uh, you can look in the back of your Bible, a lot of the Bibles will show you the, the journeys of Paul, missionary journeys. But when he writes the Ephesian letter, he's done with the missionary journeys. He's in prison, and he writes this, and he's heard of some Ephesians that have trusted Christ. Go to verse 13, Ephesians 1, 13. In whom you also trusted that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. So he's referring to the fact that somebody came to you while I'm in prison and preached to you, showed you truth, and, and they showed you the gospel of your salvation. Christ had died for their sins according to Scripture, was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. They trusted it, and when they did, they are kind of, uh, in the dark on certain things, I'm sure, because the Ephesian and Colossian letter are revelations, not prophecy, that are given to Paul. And in this revelations knowledge, you he's showing them, he's giving them understanding of how they got, and I, something popped up here, how they got their salvation and what's in, in, included in it. And so very important letter to read, especially for us, because obviously we never met Paul. He'd been dead for uh, 20 centuries. But we get Paul's spiritual writings here in the Ephesian letter, and we understand things. And 
to be honest with you, I never knew the Ephesian and Colossian letter in the Bible. Uh, most preaching and teaching in churches is made based on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then uh, uh, First John and and Old Testament, a lot of Old Testament stories and whatever. But to get into the meat of Ephesians and Colossians, I never knew it was there. And so when I began working for Brother Moore, I learned a lot, obviously, from the Ephesian Colossian letter. I, I never even knew. And it began to put things together for me because Ephesians and Colossians are the prison epistles, they call them. Paul was in prison. And what I want to look at here in Ephesians 1 what he wrote to these people was that in verse 13, again, in whom you also trusted after you heard. Now, I heard Tim Tebow say that you had to uh, repent of your sins, and then the death, burial, and resurrection was yours if you repented of your sins. And obviously, if you didn't repent of your sins, you didn't believe the death, burial, and resurrection. It says nothing about repentance here. It says in whom also in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. Now, turn the beat to second, uh, Romans 10. Where these are all simple verses, but let's tie it all together with the Ephesian letter. Romans 10. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, okay? So the hearing is what he referred to in Ephesians chapter one, in whom you heard the gospel of your salvation. Now, if you didn't hear the gospel of your salvation, obviously then you didn't get saved. That's exactly what it says. So you talk to people and say, are you saved? Oh, yes, well, how, how do you know? Well, you know, they, they were baptized, they joined the church, they did things and so forth and so on. And I apologize, the phone went off. Uh, they heard the gospel of their salvation. Uh, I never heard the gospel of my salvation when I was young. I heard what I must do. And I must walk the aisle and, and get baptized, join the church. That was the message they sent to me. Well, that ain't the gospel of my salvation. Uh, I also read that in Tim Tebow's message about John 3.16. Well, I knew John 3.16 for years. That's not the gospel of my salvation. That's not even a gospel that is preached. That's a statement, and I've said that many times. But Tim Tebow has a godly directional faith but his heart hasn't been turned. And the reason I'm saying that, if you have to repent of your sins, then that's you. That's not the Lord. Uh, you can trust the gospel of your salvation without any repentance at all, except the fact you quit trying to save yourself. That's a repentance. Most people don't believe that. I mean, just quit trying to save yourself and quit trying to impress God with your turning from your sins or being a good Christian or whatever and uh, believe in John 3, 16 and trust the good news of your salvation, the gospel of your salvation. What is it? Christ died for our sins, according to scripture, and was buried and rose again the third day. And that satisfies God. That's the, that's the power of God unto salvation. That's the way God saved you. And if you want it, you can have his inheritance. And we might get into that, might not, probably not to this week. But anyway, uh, the fact of Romans 10, 17, the faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, then look with me in our, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, referring to our walk. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse uh, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Well, the contents is about losing your house, which is your body, and having a house made without hands eternal in the heavens. We haven't seen our true life yet. It's hid in Christ with God. And we don't, we don't see any of the things that we believe 
we hear it, we learn it, we are taught it, we're shown it. Uh, the best way to teach is always preach the word. And in teaching, teaching what Paul wrote, the things that are written aforetime, all the Old Testament stuff that are written are good for our learning and, and through patience and comfort of the scripture, we might have hope. Uh, if we see that God promised something to someone and it was fulfilled in time later, we then understand that revelation is going to be fulfilled someday because it's the truth. Uh, what we have to do is we walk by faith, not by sight. I cannot, I cannot even tell you what Jesus looks like except for the fact that he looks like Adam. Whatever Adam looks like uh, is what Jesus looked like. Jesus was the last Adam. Uh, I believe that if we look at human beings, we see what Jesus looked like. I mean, that's just the way it's got to be. I mean, they can't even identify him unless somebody identifies him. I mean, he's not got a walk a aura around him and a halo and all that. He's just a man. He's the man Christ Jesus. But he's a man that if you were in your, now listen to what I say, in your right mind, you'd want to be around him. Because he does nothing but good. And he's a, a kind individual, a loving individual, and a merciful individual. He has no intent of killing you. He has no intent of of uh, betraying you. I mean, he is a human that would have been great to be around. But they didn't want him because they were doing wrong and he was right. And it's like good versus evil right there. And, and so they don't want him and they crucify him and whatever. But we walk by faith. We've never seen Jesus. We've never seen God. We've never seen the city. We've never seen any of that. But we believe it to be true because God's word says so. So we walk by faith. But now turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now remember Ephesians 1 said, in whom you heard the gospel of your salvation. Our merciful heavenly father picked a day in your life, looked at a day in your life when you could hear the gospel of your salvation. And he knew whether you'd believe it or not. I thank God every day of my life in one form or fashion that I had a chance to believe. I mean, I had a chance to believe. I'm not going to hell. I'm not going to die. I'm not going to be damned. I'm not going to be condemned because my father preached to me. How did he do it? He, he preached to a man, a preacher. Now watch in 1 Corinthians 1, 17. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Paul's mission was not to go out and baptize as Matthew 28, go or baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. It was not the commission of Acts chapter 2, repent and be baptized. His mission, his course, was to preach the gospel. Why? That was God's way of saving. All right. He said, uh, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom or words lest the cross of the Christ should be made an effect. You do not have to be a theologian or a scholar, philosopher, psychologist to preach. You preach the cross. Look at verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now, the world doesn't believe that preachers are foolish necessarily. They, if they did, they wouldn't go by the thousands to hear them. They didn't believe that Billy Graham was a, uh, a foolish individual. They uh, filled those stadiums up. Well, what's so foolish about it? It's what the preacher preaches that appears to be foolishness unto them. People look at themselves. And if you tell them that <clears throat> you can't do anything but trust the gospel of your salvation, they don't, they don't accept that. They, it can't be that simple. You, I can't live the way I am or be the way I am and be saved. Yet the Bible says you are. Now, 
you have to make a decision. Does the Bible, is it the truth? Or is it that what I've been taught is the truth? Is it that I need to join a church? Is it that I need to be baptized? Is it I need to turn from my sins? Is it I need to say the sinner's prayer? I need to do those things. Or is it the absolute truth that God's way of salvation, the power of God unto salvation, is the gospel of Christ? And you see, a person that believes that is convinced uh, look at verse 18. For the preaching cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. A person that's saved by the grace of God, he absolutely believes that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. It's not hid to him. You see, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. And people that don't believe that are lost they think it's foolish just to preach on that and to harp on that all the time. Say, can't you preach something deep? I was confronted by that by an individual one time. Brother Jerry, couldn't you preach the deep things of the Bible? I said, the deepest thing in the Bible is that which is hid. And it's the gospel of Christ. And the God of this world made sure he hid the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God and the salvation. But now turn with me to Romans 10 again. And Romans 10, watch what he says here. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord should be saved. Now, if that was the only verse we had in the Bible, then call on the name of the Lord. But what if you didn't know the name of the Lord? See, Paul went to Gentiles that didn't know the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he revealed Christ unto them. Uh, he went to preach. You could tell, like Acts 17, he went to Athens. He showed them who God was. And I'm sure he showed them who Jesus Christ was, the Son of God. But if I knew the name of Jesus Christ, according to the scripture, I could call on his name and I'd be saved. That's a great verse. But I'm, I'm going to have to read on. Verse 14. How then shall they call on him? Here's a question. How shall they call on him and him they not believe? A non-believer is not going to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. That's what he said. Well, then what are they calling on? They're calling on what the church has told them to do to be saved. It, again, if you ask somebody if they're saved, they can very well lie to you and do lie to you about their salvation. They're not secure. They're not really sure they're saved. It's a word that if, if I ask, they, they're going to agree to because it's a religious word to them. But if you ask them, what's the gospel to your salvation? About 99% of the time, they're going to take you to John 3, 16, because that's the only verse they know. I had a man come to Bible class. First time he ever came, that's all he knew is John 3, 16. He thought he had it locked down. And afterwards, he realized, I don't know nothing. That's right. You don't, because if our gospel be hid, it's hid to their law. John 3, 16, not our gospel. Okay, so in verse 14, how shall they call on him whom they not believe? And how shall they believe in him whom they not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, that's what I wanted to get to. And if you reverse this, you'll go, uh, verse 15, how shall they preach except they be sent? All right. Sent preachers so that you can hear to believe to call on. If you reverse that order, that's the, the call on is the last thing. There has to be a preacher. Well, we know something in the scripture here. Turn to 1 Timothy 2. Now, if the gospel is going to be hid, then obviously the preacher is going to be hid. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, he said, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a preacher teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. That's true. Well, wherein two is based on verse four, who will have all men to be saved. That's God, our Savior, verse three, and come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, wherein two. The due time is based on Paul being the preacher. Well, then how shall they preach except they be sent? How can they hear without a preacher? So if the preacher was Paul, 
And then he wrote down by the inspiration of the scripture, the things that he had revealed to him. And he says, look at 1 Corinthians 15, hold on to 1 Timothy 2, 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brother, I declare unto you the gospel. He calls it my gospel, Romans 2, 16, Romans 16, 25, and 2 Timothy 2, 8. He said, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. If the gospel is preached to you, that'll be the form, the way that God's going to save you. God of this world knows that, so he hides 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. That's hid. Been written for 2,000 years by Paul. He's the preacher. He wrote it down. Yet it's hid. There ain't nobody going to take you to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 in the football games with a sign. There's nobody on the roadways on these signs. They got John 3 ministries on and on and on. There's nobody that says 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 is the gospel of your salvation. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes it. They're not going to put that up there. Why? It's hid. How? Why is it hid? Because it's the power of God unto salvation. But that isn't all. Paul is hid, and he's the preacher of it. You understand this hiding? The God of this world is going to hide anything at all that has any reference or anything to do with a gospel revealed that would save you. He does not want you saved. He wants you religious. And I am i know all this stuff is simple to you, but you, you put it down in your in your memory bank and think, and the next time you deal with somebody, say, what's the gospel to your salvation? And you'll under, you're going to understand what I'm talking about real quick. Now, back in 1 Timothy chapter 2, again, he said, verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now, if you go back to verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Okay? A person gets saved. And to come into the knowledge of the truth is to follow Paul. And, of course, 1 Corinthians 4, 16, be followers of me is also my Christ, and, uh, or be followers of me. And then uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, be followers of me is also my Christ, follow Paul. Uh, the preachers are to consider what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 7. And it just goes on and on. And he tells Timothy time and time again, the things you've heard and seen in me do and on and on. He says, preach the word and, and on. It's, it's follow Paul, follow Paul. Now, <clears throat> some people say, well, you're a Paulite or whatever. I'm not a Paulite in the sense I'm not following Paul in his earthly life. I'm following Paul in what he wrote, his doctrine. And look with me uh, in verse seven again, 1 Timothy 2, 7. Whereunto then is based on the knowledge of verse four, five, and six, whereunto I am ordained. That has to do with the, the due time. Um, you think about Acts chapter nine, after the stoning of Stephen in Acts seven and eight, uh, Paul is a blasphemer, persecutor, and injurious. That's First Timothy 1.13. He's not a man that any of the apostles wanted to mess with. He's dangerous. He's not a man that believes that Jesus rose from the dead. He's not a man that believes that he needs to repent of anything. He, he, he believes that he is a dedicated Jew. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 4, 5, and 6 tells you that. If you'd ask him, he was circumcised the eight. I mean, he'd give you his heritage. That's what he'd do. He'd give heritage. But in the sense of him one day the Lord appeared to him. You go, well, why would the Lord appear to this man? Why didn't he get a, a really, let's say, a faithful Gentile? I mean, if you're going to have an apostle of Gentiles, why not get a faithful Gentile? Because the order of the Lord at that time was to go to a Jew first, and a Gentile can't go to a Jew first. So he chose a man that knew the law, he thought. He, he thought he did. 
I'm having all kinds of things here. I apologize. Uh, he knew the law, but he knew it probably traditionally and says so in Galatians, uh, traditions of my fathers. And this man could be shown by the Lord what the law really meant. He said, I was alive without the law once, but when the law revived, I died. He realized the law killed him. And he said, the law worketh wrath and on and on. And so this man can be taught of the Lord with the background he had of the law, how to deal with Jews about a righteousness that was going to be without it. In other words, he could show how that there was none righteous. And they'd know what he was talking about in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6 uh, if he went through it with them. In other words, dealing with a Jew first, you've got a Jewish uh, famous Jew, I guess you could say. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And, and I look at this thing in a way. A Jew that knew Saul of Tarsus, knew his background, knew what he had been all his life. And all of a sudden, uh, it's, like a, it's like a complete turnaround, opposite direction. And when he says everything he did religiously was counted as dung, they knew what he was talking about, dung. Dung is a, uh, a ceremony of cutting the innards out of an animal and taking it outside to camp and burn it for sin. Uh, he said that the things he did was like dumb, were dumb. They knew what he was talking about. And he says, we are the circumcision, which worship Christ in the spirit, whatever, uh, not in the flesh. Matter of fact, look in uh, Philippians. I hope I'm making a point to you here and not confusing you or whatever. Um, I mean, it's so interesting when I think about Paul. Uh, the verse I'm trying to see. Uh, Philippians 3, verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Imagine a Jew hearing that. Uh, uh, let's say an Orthodox Jew, and I don't know how that Orthodox Reform Conservative, I, I guess that Orthodox is the one that would be um, do all the things and the, call them rabbis and whatever else. But imagine hearing that everything you did was going to be counted as dumb, that you might know Christ the way he is and not after the flesh. He said, we, we knew Christ after the flesh, but now we know him no more after the flesh. Um, everything that Paul had was spiritually revealed. And it were the revelation in Revelation in Romans chapter 3 would inflame any Jew. There is none righteous. Well, they believed they were. Paul said he believed he was. It's touching the righteousness which in the law blameless. Philippians 3. And for the man that says it's touching the righteous law, then then write Romans three ten. There's none righteous. Would hit a, a Jew right in the face. And then to say that everything you did as a Jew was but dumb would hit him in the face. And of course, Paul suffered for this. But then again, that's why the Lord chose a Jew to be the apostle of the Gentiles. The Gentiles didn't know anything. Thus, when he wrote the Roman letter, you got Roman citizens that have been circumcised and are resting in the law and teaching the law. He's telling them, you can't teach it anymore. It, it ain't going to work. The righteousness of God without the law. And he's showing that to them. Uh, he shows the Galatians who were circumcised after they had received the spirit. Fools and on and on. I mean, these letters have meanings if you read them. But of course, then again, in religion, I didn't know anything about these letters. I was in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, and I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when I was young. And I shut it. It was like, oh, my gosh. Who can live up to this and all this stuff? Well, there was law involved. There were sacrifices in, involved and all that. And I'm a Gentile. I don't know nothing about that stuff. I mean, how many Gentiles, you know, know where the Ten Commandments are in the Bible? 
They don't know it's Deuteronomy 5 and, and Exodus 20. They don't know it's there. But how come I, as a Gentile, know it? Because I studied the Bible. I studied. Even though I'm a Gentile, I've studied the Old Testament. But my apostle showed me that as I study this, it is not for me. It is for learning. It's for patience and comfort. What he wrote was for me. And I learned the things that he wrote. And it's, it's beautiful what we learn from Paul and not be subject to bondage. I guess I could say it that way. So back in this, the ideology, the thing I'm, I'm talking about, the preacher is Paul. He was showed the power. The preachers, go back to Romans 10, now watch. In Romans 10. I hope I can get this over to you, and it, if I don't, it's my fault. In Romans 10, I said it's simple. All this is simple, but sometimes I make things where you can't see it, probably. In Romans 10, verse 15. No, uh, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they hear uh, believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? All right, we have to have, hold this. Go to Timothy again. We have to have a preacher. Now, I had a preacher. I heard one of the best preachers I ever heard. And worked with him and whatever. But he was sent. Now watch, 1 Timothy uh, 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I've heard... I've heard people preach that have never lived anything of life and they don't really know anything about life. I've heard a young preacher, young preacher. I'm not a young preacher. I've experienced life and done things I wished I hadn't, uh, things I wished I couldn't remember, and things like that. But I can preach to you about sin. I know sin. I know what sinning is i've done sinning and i was in jail one time witnessing uh, on a sunday night and a guy cussed me and i said is that your best shot and he looked at me kind of confused and i said man you don't know how to cuss i worked on a railroad i know how to cuss and it got his attention uh he was making the pentecostals in there so mad because of his cussing that they wanted to get, get at him and whatever it doesn't upset me. I mean, I've been cussed and I have cussed and I've cussed people down. And they've cussed me down. And I mean, that, that's just a way of life when I was living it. Do I cuss now? It'll come out of me every once in a while. And I am I hate to say it, but it comes out of me when anger comes out of me. Oh, there's things I say that I wished I wouldn't say. And I'll be praying and things come out of me in my mind and on and on. That's just the nature of man. The nature of man's out of way. And I wouldn't try to blow smoke on you. I don't do that no more. Yeah, I do. I do. And uh, I'm sorry to say I do it, but I have scripture that tells me that's normal. It's not a sickness or that I have something wrong with me. It's normal. It's a normal thing because I'm carnal, sold under sin. Romans 7. Well, Romans 7 is probably a, as good a chapter to read when you're having fleshly problems to understand it. This man here, look in verse 15, uh, 16, how be it for this cause I obtained mercy. He obtained mercy because he was a sinner. Not only was he a sinner, he said he was chief of sinners. He was a blasphemer, persecutor, injurious. And God saved him in spite of that. Now that's, you got to think about your salvation. God saved you in spite of you. It didn't throw God off center, knowing what you would do in life, that he would say, well, I'm just going to go send him. I'm not going to save him because of what he is. And those things he, he does and continually does or continues to do. I, I, oh, no, I can't. That has nothing to do with it. There was a man that loved you and I more than living and he loved to live uh, he had people he loved uh, he experienced God creation himself that he created he experienced it 
in the flesh. You know, you think about Jesus comes down and in the flesh gets to experience what he created in a flesh form like men. And we have emotions, we have feelings, we have uh, desires, we have things that uh, some things are good, some things are bad. Jesus experienced all this and always did the right thing with it. We don't, we sin. He didn't sin. But he experienced his creation that he created and walked in it and observed the people. Uh, I personally believe, as I've told you many times, when he was in the garden, uh, 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 in the uh, uh, up on the mountain, uh, Matthew 4, where he was in the wilderness, I apologize. He fasted 40 days, prayed to the Father, and I believe they discussed what it was like to live in the flesh. We're, we're, not, we're not controlled by a God that doesn't know now. He knows by his son. He knows what it's like to live in this evil world. The only thing he doesn't know is how to live in a vile body until the cross. His body, him, he was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He felt it right there. He felt what it was like to have the wrath of God and the, the sinful payment put on him so that we'd never feel it. We'll never have to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Our entire life saved life. God's not forsaking us. Sometimes we feel like things are going wrong. God hadn't forsaken us. It's just part of living. Sickness and anger, uh, things that go on in the flesh, that, that's not the wrath of God and that's not the anger of God. It's the allowance to walk in him and to believe that he's able. It's a learning process. And sometimes the more we get persecuted, the stronger the Lord works for us and the stronger we become in faith. We don't go around blaming people for this and that. I, hey, I don't blame anybody for anything. I mean, I want to. Uh, I'd like to nuke some people for what they have done to people in the world. But you know what? It ain't surprised God at all. There's nothing happening that God didn't know about. But what he's doing, he's letting us set our affections on things above, not on things of the earth. He's letting us consider how much greater it would be to be with the Father than to be here on earth. But the flesh is flesh, and it's always there fighting. And <clears throat> so here in Paul in 1 Timothy 1.16, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Well, go back to Romans 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And our preacher was a Jew that was saved by the grace of God, given the gospel of Christ to trust, and he did, and he delivered it. When he went to Macedonia and Thessalonica and Corinth, he didn't go over and try to show his religious traditional Jewish things. He went over and said, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to scripture and was buried and rose again the third day according to scripture. I can't imagine teaching a Bible class or going to a conference or anything else or teaching a new Bible class without preaching the gospel of Christ in it. Why? Because I have no idea who is in there of whether they believe or not. The only God knows that. And if you believe, it, it just empowers you more to hear it over and over. And if you're lost, then you can hear something 
that would help you to understand I need this for my salvation because it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them believe. Not, not a church builder or anything like into that. All right, so Paul is our preacher and he wrote down what preachers need. So as him being the preacher, he shows us the power, the preachers that are sent. Now watch this in verse 15. How shall they, he went from a preacher in verse 14 to 15, how shall they, the followers of the preacher, how shall they preach except they be what? Sent. No, let's just get it down to fact. Every preacher that is of God is sent. And he will never be in doubt about Paul. I believe that with my heart. And my heart's deceitful above all things. Why did I believe it with my heart? Because with all my heart, I believe that God means what he says. He sent preachers to preach the gospel of Christ. And they have to follow Paul. They have to, because if they go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or John 3, 16, that's not sin of God. I know one preacher today that, preached for many years in a Baptist church and a situation arose in the Baptist church, fleshly thing, and it caused him to resign. He came in contact with somebody that showed him the gospel of Christ and he got saved after 15 years of preaching. He's not a preacher anymore. He's a student of it. He comes to Bible class regularly. He gives and uh, he, I mean, <laughs> where he was being given to, now he's given. And that individual is joyous of the fact that he's saved. He is very sorrowful and very hurt, hurt in his mind that all those years he deceived people. He had people that came to him afterwards and called him a liar and everything else. But he's very, I mean, it hurts him to think that he, all those years he did that to those people and he baptized people and got them to join the church and everything and didn't preach to them the gospel of Christ because he didn't know it. It's hid. Oh, yeah, he can be hid to a preacher. He can say, oh, no, he, he preacher said it. No, it's hid to preacher. If our gospel will be his, if you know it, you deliver it. Well, you know that. So you go over this and, and think about this. Turn to Col uh, Colossians chapter 2. Now, in this trust, and, and you saw that in Romans 10, a preacher and then they that preach are sent. So... Uh, Colossians. It's hard to imagine God sending me, but he did. The way, and see, you, you think in terminology of the flesh again. Well, look at Brother Jerry. He don't look like a preacher. He doesn't talk like a preacher. He doesn't act like a preacher. He doesn't dress like a preacher. So I don't know. Well, I've always asked people, what does a preacher look like? I mean, is the characteristics of a preacher laid out there, how they look? Uh, you see, the way preachers are accepted today is how they look. And it's kind of based on the Old Testament of how the priests looked. They were all in great garments and, and, and things they had on. And so the preachers today all dress nice and have the expensive suits of this day and all that. Was well, that the way a preacher was supposed to look? Well, John the Baptist didn't look like that. He wore camel's hair, eating locusts, wild honey, and probably didn't smell too good. But how is a preacher supposed is we, do we need the qualification of the preacher? I'm very sure the qualification of the preacher is in 2 Timothy. Before I read Colossians, I'm going to give it to you. Here's the qualifications of the preacher. 2 Timothy. Paul wrote it down. 2, Corinth, uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God had not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That spirit of fear is not the fleshly fear. Paul had fear. He said, I come with you with fear and tremblings and preaching. That's not the spirit of fear. That's just the fleshly fear. The spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the, uh, of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has, number one qualification, saved us. A preacher gets saved. 
then called us with an holy calling, called to go forth, that's ascending, with a holy ministry, with a holy purpose, a, a holy calling. They've always been here for 20 centuries. They've always been preachers, sin of God, holy, saved, secured, that would try to teach you Paul's letters. Say, so, well, how do you know? Because God said so. I mean, the Bible ain't going to change. It didn't change in 20 centuries. It was brought forth in English by the 1611 and English speaking Bible by the, the allowance of King James. But it's been there since the first century because Paul wrote these things in the first century. And so the preachers that are sent have been saved and called with a holy calling. And they reach out to who God knows. Uh, look at Romans 8. In Romans 8, verse um, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. If you go back 20 centuries and count each century into things that went on in those centuries, you'd wonder how could things be working together for good? Well, look to your life, your birth, and your life where one day God called you. He called you by the foolishness of preaching. He preached the cross to you. He gave you the chance to believe. Uh, rejoice in the Lord with that. Be thankful that the Lord chose you, knowing you would do this in verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also, them he also glorified. Wow. In God's knowledge before the foundation of the world, he had you holy and without blame before him in love because he knew what the son would do and he knew what the word said because he is the word. And he looked and there was a speck out there, a little speck way out there in the future that was me. And he saw the presentation of the cross, which by the faith of Jesus Christ was willing to do he was willing to be forsaken and then go into hell and wait for the resurrection of justification. And he knew that day when somebody would tell me that I was forgiven, justified, and saved. And he saw that in me. He saw that I would accept that. With me, something else. He also saw a day when I accept his calling to preach. And I said, what does it feel like to be called of God to preach? It comes through men. Men ask you to teach. Men ask you to do things that goes against what you are and what you thought. They kept asking me to teach, and I go, why would you want me to teach? I'm nobody in front of these men. These, these men are elders and whatever. Now, we'd like for you to teach. I was called uh, one, one day in uh, Dolphin Island to preach at Brother Lange's church, and I, I was a driver. And I got up and taught that the King James Bible was the Word of God. And I didn't know it, but in that church, they didn't believe that. And the only person in there smiling was Brother Moore. And when I sat down, I said, bro, what happened? Did I do something that bad? And he said, they don't believe the King James. You just put it on them. And he was happy about it. I didn't know. But God undoubtedly had me get up that day to present the fact that one day you're going to be judged for what this man showed you about the King James Bible. And don't you get your, don't ever count yourself, uh, be fooled by this. The King James Bible is the word of God. The Lord God is not going to deny the faith of his son in any Bible whatsoever. And he don't deny it in the King James Bible and the rest of them he does even in the new King James. 
And God Almighty is not going to deny the faith and the work of his son for better learning from a Bible brought down to men's understanding. The King James does not have to be brought down to men's level. It has to have the spirit in the man to know what the spirit of God wrote. It's by inspiration. And somebody said, I just don't understand that old King James. It's old and archaic, all of these and thou's. Are you kidding me? What's so hard to understand about thee and thou? There ain't nothing hard about that. Uh, you want a, a verse? Uh, there's, I mean, there's several verses in there. Uh, Romans 7. Uh, Romans 11. And if by grace is no more works. On and on. I mean, let, let me read that. that that's uh, amazing here. Let me read Romans 11, verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Let me say, that's kind of confusing. No, it ain't. Grace is grace. Works is works. Grace ain't works and works ain't grace. That's real simple. But what, what is it simple to? It's simple to a believer as he's taught and understand. He grows because, number one, a person that trusts and let's go through these things real quick. Colossians. In this trust, in Colossians chapter 2, the preachers that are sent preach the gospel of Christ. Then they begin to teach because Paul had that ministry together too. Then they begin, they're pastors and teachers. They begin to teach the people that continually come, that continue to desire and want to grow. He teaches them Colossians 2.10. Because you, you don't know this right off. You know that you trusted the gospel of Christ and you believe you're saved. Okay? That makes you a babe in Christ. Okay? As a babe in Christ, you don't necessarily know you're complete in Christ because they can be people come in and bother you and trouble you and might even convince you to get baptized or something else like the Galatians got uh, circumcised. <clears throat> you're being bewitched. You're being uh, persuaded. The idea of a pastor teacher is to establish somebody, let them grow, come from a babe to being grown in Colossians 2.10. I wouldn't have had a clue this was in the Bible when I was in the Baptist church. Colossians 2.10. And you are complete in him. I wonder what it means. I'm complete in him. Then He's going to tell me what the completeness is. Number one, the completeness in verse 11 is I'm circumcised. I'm cut away from my body. I'm crucified with Christ, buried with him. That's the next thing he says, buried with him in verse 12 in a baptism that is, has nothing to do with water. My apostle wasn't sent to baptize. He don't have to baptize because you're already baptized into uh, Christ. And I'm risen. Not only am I crucified, I'm buried, I'm risen. And being risen, I'm seated at the right hand of the Father. He's going to show me Ephesians chapter 2 in Christ. So that as Christ sitting there at the right hand of the Father, everything is done that's necessary for me. And being done for me, I don't have to worry about none of it. I don't have to accomplish anything. I don't have to do anything to make the salvation any better than it is because I'm crucified, buried, and raised, and my life is hid up there. I have a house not made with hands eternal in heavens if I were to die. And if I don't die and I go out alive, I can have my vile body changed and fashioned like unto his glorious body. My goodness. Well, doesn't that change your life attitude? Doesn't that change your emotion about worrying? Doesn't that change your emotion and your feelings about, I hope I can get it right? You don't have to. It is right. It's complete. But the preacher has to show you that. I did not know that. And yet it's been written. Now, uh, on Ephesians chapter 1. Now, if Ephesians 1, if I was to be shown this and believe it, 
I would never confess my sins. I would never have to. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According, he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The love of Christ settles the issue of the holiness. The holiness, holy and without blame, was established in what Jesus did. <clears throat> He's my life. He's my death, burial, and my resurrection. He's my glory. He's everything. So I don't have to worry about sins. I don't have to worry that because of what I am, something might separate me from God. It doesn't. Uh, Romans 8, look with me, Romans 8. And again, I tell you, these are simple verses, you know them. But if you don't, maybe put them in perspective. In Romans 8, 38, for I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities. And by the way, this thing in death, and of course, today we're in a world right now terrorized by uh, domestic terrorism that are afraid they're going to die. Well, death can't separate you from the love of God. It can't. But watch. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels. An angel can't come down here and separate me from the love of God. Well, then, if angels can't, then 2 Corinthians 11, I fear lest any, by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtly, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity in Christ. If you were to fall for something, it wouldn't separate you from the love of God. That, that's the, the incredible mercy and the kindness and the understanding of our God is. Our understanding of God is that we are have an infirmity. The infirmity is the flesh. And the flesh can be convinced of a lot of things. Uh, that's why I tell people, I say, stay away from the news, stay away from all this stuff, because they're working on your flesh to get at your mind. Your minds, uh, let me read something to you. Colossians, while I'm thinking about it. Colossians chapter one. Now, a smart preacher can take you to task on this. Well, I'm not a smart preacher, but I'm going to show you what it says and not worry about it. A lot of people say, well, you go to a point in your life and then you trust Christ. And from that point on, you got to live it. And you, if you sin, you confess your sins and so forth and so on. And if you fall away, you backslid and you rededicate or whatever. And they can take you to this verse, Colossians 1.21. And you that were sometimes alienated enemies in your mind, in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you wholly unreprovable. I apologize. To present you wholly unblameable and unreprovable in sight if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. And they'd say, see, there you, if you, uh, if you do those things, if you stay with it, you'll be all right. But if you don't continue, then you're going to be in trouble with God. No, you're going to be in trouble with yourself because your mind is what's in verse 21. And he wants your mind to be trained on the truth where that you don't be tossed to and fro where you don't get to where you think that God's mad at you, or you won't get to where you think that you're out of the will of God in the sense of you, you might get lost and not go to heaven. Things, things like that that they try to tell you. But, but wait a minute. You are given the mind of Christ. That's in uh, 1 Corinthians 2.16. The mind of Christ can show you the scriptures because in verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unremblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled. So the thing that the devil is going to work on is your mind 
to get you to part from the faith or deny the faith. But the problem is the denial of the faith. If you're lost, you ain't never been with the Lord in the first place. If you uh, have the faith hid to you, you're not with Christ. But if you have trusted Christ, you're in the faith, then the devil's going to work on your mind that you suffer in your mind to where you can't be a clear cut testimony of the absolute truth of the God of God's gospel in the first place. You see, your mind has to be trained. Look in Romans 12. In Romans 12, nothing's going to take you away from God. Nothing. That's what Romans 8 is all about. But your mind can be corrupted. He didn't say flesh in 2 Corinthians 11. He said mind. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, all your life, you were like the Colossians. You thought that you maybe had done some things that God probably couldn't forgive you of, or that you were just too bad that God wouldn't save you, or that you wasn't doing right and you need to get into church and get it right, and rededicate or whatever. That is your mind has been taught this. Your mind needs to coincide with what the Bible says. If you have the mind of Christ, if there's a day when you trusted the gospel of your salvation, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise, that mind is in you, but it's a baby and it needs to be taught. That's what the holy calling of the pastors and teachers is. First, they show you how God saved you. Then they show you what you have in salvation and they show you how to walk in that salvation. Well, you be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's not that you get a new mind, you renew your mind. Your mind is there. It's always been there. You don't have a mind, you're dead. Uh, that's why when you're on a life support, there's no brain activity. Your mind's gone. I mean, you're not thinking any longer. But as long as you have a mind, you can have that mind renewed. Think of things differently. I, I was talking about the other day. I don't know if I, you remember, but one of the curses, and I hate to say the word curse, but one of the, the disadvantages of salvation in this world is you see it for what it is. And you know it's vile. I mean, uh, evil. You know this world's evil. And there are evil things going on in it right now that are totally in the plan of God. I and mean, it's not something that you should lay down and curl up behind because, oh my God, what's going to happen? It's going to happen. There ain't nothing you can do about it. I, I see people, uh, we were watching a movie the other day, Kathy and I, these people were protesting and all that, and they were younger people. And I said, you know, I bet they didn't even vote and they're protesting. One of your ways to do things is vote. Another thing is we have the right to bear arms. That's the Constitution. We have the right to bear arms against the government, but nobody will do it because they're afraid. They're afraid of the IRS. They're afraid of what the government will do. But we have that right. We're just not exercising. Well, you have the right to learn, scriptural-wise, because you have a mind that will teach you. Get in the scripture. Get in Paul. Follow Paul and see what the Spirit is going to show you. Well, he's going to show you you're a babe in Christ. You need to grow. He shows you you have a mind of Christ. He shows you you need to renew your mind. Be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 5. You need to walk as dear children, Ephesians chapter 5. You walk as dear children, being instructed, being shown, and not being figuring that the instruction was the wrath of God, but yeah, he was chasing his children. He was teaching his children. You're to redeem the time, Ephesians chapter 5. You're to pray without ceasing. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You have an intercessor as you pray. So that gives you great confidence that the mediation is being made, the intercession is being made, that you don't have to worry whether you say it right or wrong. God's spirit makes intercession. Uh, his spirit being his dear son, 
his son makes intercession with the father and on and on. Uh, the praying, we have a right to pray and we have a right to do what Jesus did. And this is what's amazing. People say, well, how do I know I'm a child of God? I want you to turn to Romans 8 and watch. This is a really clear thing. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14, for as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, however you want to say it. And somebody said, how do we know that we're children of God? Okay. A child of God. Okay, let's just use it in physical terms. Uh, you have a son or a daughter. The son or daughter can call you father because you're her, her or his father. Uh, they call you daddy affectionately, daddy or papa, or you know different words that people use. Usually, grandkids use papa. Mama, Mima, Mia, you know, different names. But the child has a right to cry, call to his father, father, okay? If I can find in the scripture where Jesus said the same thing we did, then we know that Romans 8 is clear. Turn to Mark 14. In Mark 14, and watch what this says. All right, in Mark 14, verse 15, uh, 35. Now, Jesus in the garden, and he said, as he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed, that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. This is great, great fear of the Lord of knowing what he wrote about himself is going to come about. And then in verse 36, he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Now, he said, Abba, Father, okay? Go back to Romans 8, uh, verse 16, uh, 15. For you have received not the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. This absolutely, can, absolutely secures verse 17, uh, 16. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If I am adopted into that house that has the son and a daughter that call their father, father. Now I have the right by adoption to come in that house and cry him, cry to him, father. Also, he's my father now too. In birth, we are inheritance of Adam. We're going to die. In Ephesians 1, turn to Ephesians 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In whom, that is the dear son, that is Christ, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. If I am adopted by God, I'm brought into his household. That's Ephesians and Colossians. I'm brought into his household, and I have the right to cry, Abba, Father. That means I'm a son of God. Why would I walk around in fear? Why would I walk around wondering if it'll really happen? When I am a adopted child of God, I get the inheritance, already have it. The inheritance is mine. I have it. And I have the right to cry, Abba, Father. And my father is going to take care of me just like he does his son. He took care of his son. He raised him. Well, in Christ, he has already raised me. And all I'm doing is waiting for a day of redemption. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. That day of redemption will never pass me by. It will get me because I'm his adopted son. And being adopted, he takes care of me. He can do exceedingly above all that I ask or think. He takes care of me. He can make all grace abound towards me that I have all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good works. He's able to do more than I pray for. 
I can make supplication to him. I can talk to him. I can argue with him about the things that are going on in my life. He can help me. He can give me confidence. He can give me hope. He can give me joy. He can give me peace. Why? Because he's my father by adoption. And I'm a babe in Christ. I have the mind of Christ. I can renew my mind. I can walk as dear children. I can redeem the time that he gave me. I can pray without ceasing. I can rejoice in him. I can set my affections on him, on the things of heaven that are in heaven, all spiritual blessing. And I am taught to beware of those things that will try to change my mind about that. All because I follow Paul, because that's what Paul did. He knew it. He wrote it down and were to read according to Ephesians 3. Paul had a knowledge in Ephesians 3, 1 through 4 that you ought to read. You'd understand why you're a child of God. Or to remember Ephesians 2, 11, what we were in time past, but now we have. And we're to study, to learn to be quiet and trust the Lord. And basically just bear up, just stand still in the sense of standing in what the Lord is going to do. Amen.